In a recent tournament I went to, I had gone undefeated in the Swiss rounds and had made it to the top 4 of the tournament as the first seed. I'm about to play game 3 of my top 4 match with the massive advantage of getting to choose who starts. At this point, I feel unstoppable. I've played pretty well all day and not only does my deck excel at going first and putting up an unbreakable board, my opponent's also playing Branded, a deck that doesn't have the ability to play as many disruptive hand traps as other decks do. The game is in the bag. I tell my opponent I'll be going first. I draw my opening 5 cards and just like that, it's all over. Just like the last time he shot a basketball, I bricked. This caused me to bomb out of the tournament as a result. It was a frustrating moment for sure since it felt like the game was completely in my control and that I would gotten extraordinarily unlucky, but this got me thinking. I'm sure you've all had similar experiences in the past or would love to never have something like this happen to you. Now what if I told you I'd cooked up a surefire way to make sure that you'd never lose another game of Yu-Gi-Oh again? You think I'm lying and well, I would be. But that's not to say that there isn't a way to make sure that you always give yourself the best chance to win. And that's what I'm going to show you in today's video. Now what's the secret behind winning more of your games? The power of math. But regardless of how you feel about math, all it takes is some basic statistics and ratios to ensure that you always have the best chance to win your games. Now before we begin, I also want to clarify that I didn't come up with all the concepts or the numbers discussed in this video. I'll credit the sources in the description below so you can check them out for more information on this topic. I've also posted a video covering the same topic as this video but with more technical terms on my channel already, so you can check that out in the description below if that's something you're interested in. This video is going to assume that you're already familiar with the terms I cover in that video, so be sure to check it out if you haven't seen it already. Alright, with that being said, let's get straight into it. I'm going to start by going over what the difference is between engine and non-engine. To put things simply, your deck will consist of two types of cards, engine cards and non-engine cards. In a nutshell, an engine card is simply a card that helps you, your deck accomplish its win conditions and further its own game plan, whereas a non-engine card is pretty much everything else. Engine cards can be broken down into starters, extenders, and engine requirements, whereas non-engine cards can be broken down into defense, removal, and bomb cards. Be sure to stick around until the very end of this video since I'm going to be telling you exactly how many of each card you should be playing in your 40 card deck to give yourself the best chance of winning. If your deck is over 40 cards, the numbers and probabilities will be slightly different, but the overall concepts discussed in the video will be the same. Just keep in mind that while these are general guidelines, there are going to be certain decks and formats that weren't breaking these deck building guidelines. Alright, so let's start with the starter cards. Since starter cards are the cards you always want to open with, you'll want to play a high enough number of them to see them often enough. After all, you don't want to be losing games to where you simply brick and have no plays you can make. In a 40 card deck, it is recommended to include around 11 to 13 starters in your deck. As you can see, this will give you about an 80 to 85% chance of seeing at least one in your opening hand, which is what you want. Now I know what you're thinking. Why not play more in order to increase that chance and make it closer to 100% you might ask? That's because of the law of diminishing returns. Essentially, the more starter cards you add to your deck, the less you get out of each additional one. For example, going from playing 11 to 13 starters as you see here gives you around a 4.5 to 5% increase in seeing one, but going from 13 to 15 starters only gives you around a 1.5% chance of seeing one. You want to make sure you have enough space in your deck to see other engine and non-engine cards often enough, so making sure that you don't play too many starters is also important. As a quick note, I've made it specifically so that we only calculate the odds of seeing 3 starter cards max in your hand since any more would not really be ideal, but adjusting it to a maximum of 5 will not have too much of an impact on the probabilities shown. Uh, it would be around like a 2% increase or so for both. Now moving on, I have a picture of a super heavy samurai deck list here with the starter cards it plays highlighted. You can see that it plays 12 starter cards which lines up with what we've discussed. I'm going to be using this super heavy samurai deck list for the rest of the video since I think it does a good job of adhering to these values while also just having enough room for discussion in certain parts. Now let's talk about extenders. Extenders are cards that work in conjunction with starter cards to help your deck make plays and are necessary to increase the ceiling of your deck and help your starter plays through disruptions. Sometimes 
Drawing multiple extenders can also fulfill the role of drawing a starter card, increasing your deck's consistency overall. Normally, you should aim to include 12 to 14 extenders in your deck, but this number can vary depending on the size of your deck's engine and the quality of your extenders. As you can see, this number is higher than your starters because extenders can not only sometimes start your plays, but also make them more powerful as well. Note that sometimes cards can act as both starters and extenders, like Super Heavy Samurai Soul Peacemaker in our example here, meaning that you can get away with playing a smaller number of these cards. There are other exceptions to these rules, but most decks will want to stick to this rule so that your deck is consistent as, as possible. As you can see in the Super Heavy Samurai list, we have 9 cards that are exclusively extenders, but our starter cards like Motorbike and Wakaushi also double as extenders due to their powerful effects, meaning the true number of extenders we play is higher. Speaking of consistency, let's talk about engine requirements. These are the cards that you never want to draw, but you have to play as a trade-off for playing some very powerful engine cards. Of course, you want to consider having as few engine requirements as possible in your deck, since drawing these engine requirements doesn't do anything to help your plays. However, do keep in mind that the reason people play decks with engine requirements in it is because having these bricks in your deck is worth it if it can increase the number and or quality of starters or extenders you can play, or if it allows your deck to perform much more powerful combos. For example, this would be cards like Ancient Gear Box and Infinite Track Tunneler in the Super Heavy Samurai deck. These allow Super Heavy Samurais to have a much stronger resource management game and nets them extra resources from the bodies and draws that they provide. At the end of the day, you have a roughly 12.5% chance of opening one engine requirement in your hand if you play one, so it won't happen that often. Keep in mind though that most decks nowadays are powerful enough to even if you do draw some dead cards in your hand, your starters and extenders are strong enough to carry the game on their own. In the case of Super Heavy Samurai, since their combos only require one card and one discard, having a few dead cards uh, in the hand potentially usually will not cost you the game and it's definitely worth it to play these powerful cards in your deck for that reason. Now before we continue with the video, I just want to quickly give a shout out to both your playmat and card trader zero. If you want to get your own custom designed card sleeves, playmats, or tabletop mats, be sure to check out your playmat for the highest quality products using my affiliate link in the description below to get 10% off your entire order while helping to support the channel. Also, sign up for card trader zero using my affiliate link below to stop paying exorbitant shipping fees when shopping for cards online. Just by signing up using my link, you'll be helping to support the channel even if you don't make a purchase. But if you do make a purchase, you'll also be helping to support the channel for the cards you'd already be buying, and I'd greatly appreciate it. With that being said, let's get back into the video. Next up is the non-engine part of your deck. The first category is defense cards, and in today's game, that's going to be hand traps like Ash Blossom and Joy Spring if you're playing a non-control deck, and trap cards if you're going to be playing a control deck. The, this number is going to vary heavily depending on the size of your deck's engine, since you always want to ensure that your deck is still going to be able to do what it's supposed to do before trying to stop your opponent. However, depending on the format, you may need to play more defense cards in order to compete with the other decks out there. For example, if there's an FDK deck prevalent in the meta, you would have to include more hand trap cards to lower your opponent's potential or, and disrupt their deck's efficiency. It's generally recommended to play at least 6 defense cards in your deck. Although this number might seem low, there are times where your engine cards and other non-engine cards can also fulfill the defense role, so it doesn't have to be limited to hand traps or trap cards. If you want more details on this, then once again check out the video I have in the description below. With that being said, however, the modern game has evolved to the point where it's standard to be able to play at least 6 to 9 hand traps in your deck, with the number going as high as 15 to 18 sometimes. Just keep in mind that your deck's engine still needs to be able to function if you do decide to increase the number of defense cards in your deck. We see that in this super heavy samurai deck list here that there are 15 hand traps and that's not only because their engine doesn't take up that much room in the deck, but also because the May 2023 format that this deck list was taken from warrants it due to the prevalence of combo decks like super heavy samurai and how strong they are if they can go un uninterrupted. Next up, we'll be moving on to Bomb Cards. Bomb Cards require more setup or conditions to be met compared to Starter or Extender Cards. Examples of these include Chaos Dragon Levianir, Raigeki, or Jizuku the Starter Shrine Kaiju in the decklist you see. 
Bomb cards offer a trade-off between playability in your opening hand and their potential later on in the game. While they may not be useful if drawn early, they can be extremely powerful when your opponent has established a strong board. Thus, it's generally advisable to include 2-3 to three bomb cards in your deck if they're not searchable. You wouldn't want to play too many of these since they don't add to your deck's consistency and are only as good as your opponent lets them be. Since Jizukiru is searchable off of Cleaf Genius in the Super Heavy Samurai deck, playing one is sufficient since you'll always be able to search it when you need it. As a quick side note, you could also consider Therion King Regulus shown in this decklist as a bomb card depending on your interpretation of it. So moving on to the next category, we have cards that raise and re-raise your ceiling, which are essentially in a nutshell, any card that acts as a removal card. Re-raise ceiling is a technical term I explained more in my other video on this topic, so be sure to check it out in the description if you're interested in learning more about that. Most of the time, your engine or extra deck cards will fulfill this role of being able to remove things, so there isn't necessarily a set number of these that you should play, especially some, some, since some decks will have searchable removal cards, whereas other decks will have to rely on non-engine cards to do the trick. However, these cards should at least be side decks since they are crucial when going second. Your opponent will usually establish their board and you will need to be able to play the game to have a chance at victory. An example of this would be playing 3-6 spell or trap removal cards in your side deck depending on how popular back row is during the format. So that's going to do it for me today. I've gone over some ratios that you should keep in mind when deck building to make your decks more consistent and win you more games so that you don't end up in a situation like I did at the start of this uh, presentation. Like I said before, I did not come up with these theories or numbers. Rather, they're taken from these articles on TCG Player Infinite, which I will link in the description below so you guys can check them out for more information. I just wanted to put this in a visual format and give examples relating to our modern day Yu-Gi-Oh format. If you guys want to keep learning how to become a better player, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. Only a very small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed, and by subscribing, you're letting me know that you're interested in what you see. And with that, I will see you guys soon. Take care.